The sign or the really display there says it all. What do you stand there looking? Or why? Why do you stand there looking? What are you looking at? I know for a fact, I know for a fact, it's got to be really interesting at the Hayes household because they are our neighbors. They're probably looking out their windows all the time and looking, what in the world are they doing now? All the children running around, who knows whatever I'm doing out there, right? They're probably doing that, and, and there's that time, you know, remember months and months and months ago where we were out late at night, standing in that middle of the, well, whatever we call that out there, the football field, the soccer field, whatever it is, and we're gazing up at this moon because it's supposed to be a blood-red moon. See, at least they had information that time, right, Pastor Jerry? You had information. He didn't have to ask the question, what are you doing out there looking up in the sky for, right? And yet today I'm wondering if you've asked that question or had that question asked to you. Why? Why do you stand there looking? Well, just to help you out in case you can't think of a, a thought or a time, I'm wondering maybe you've had the experience where you've been looking up really at the stars and you see, try to see shooting stars, right? And you're out there because you've got to stay out there the whole time. You've got to watch the sky. You can't take your eyes off. Otherwise, that's when they go across. Or maybe, just maybe, the satellite's in orbit. You know, if you do this uh, outside in the country somewhere, away from the city lights, you can see them a lot easier. You can actually see some of the orbits that are, or, or satellites that are going through their orbit. You can follow along this little teeny tiny dot, and it goes in a straight path, and you can see it. But it's got to be really, really, really dark. Maybe somebody has asked you the question, well, what do you, why? Why are you standing there looking? Maybe, just maybe, you're in the vicinity of this big place called the O'Hare Airport, and you, sil you see these big silver birds taking off and landing, right? In fact, on a side story, on a side note, I've taught my son one of those things that, I don't know if dads are supposed to do this or not, but I've done this very well, I think. Levi, I've taught him that whenever he sees a big bird, or whenever he sees a big plane, I already gave it away. I tell him, I say, get up, big bird. And so sure enough, I taught him that, and he says it too. So one day I was inside the house, and I was doing something, the, the windows were open or whatever, and I could hear the plane flying over. And all of a sudden I hear this little voice go, get up, big bird. And I'm like, yeah, that's my boy, that's my boy. But isn't it something when we're taking a look at something that's so amazing in the sky? It's something that's so awesome that we've got to just stand there and look at it. We wonder how all of that tonnage of metal gets up and flies. We take a look at those orbits, those satellites that are in orbit, how they stay there and, and how they do all their technology things, right? It's amazing. The shooting star that flies across as it goes and, and skims across the atmosphere seeing that once-in-a-lifetime, maybe, blood-red moon, right? All these things are amazing. Or better yet, maybe I've got one more for that person out there. Maybe it's fireworks for you. Maybe it's that person who loves to sit out there, and they just, oh, look at that, oh, wow, boom, bang, and all this kind of stuff. It's going off awesome. And then when it ends, you sit there, and you're still standing there looking. Uh, show's over. Hello, why are you still standing there? It's because they want to see the rest of it. They want to see the rest of the show. They want more. They want to see what's taking place. But as in our scripture lesson today, we understand now why the disciples were standing there in the passage of Acts that was read by uh, uh, Jeff. As that was read, we understand that they were looking up, and, and as Jesus was giving them final instructions, the day of ascension came, the 40th day after, right? And he's ascending, he's being taken up in the clouds, and they can't see him anymore. He was right there, and Jesus is talking to him. He's, he's really kind of floating away. He's going away, and he's, he's giving him the blessing, basically. And then they're squinting. They're trying to see where he's at. And sure enough, there are angels right beside him. They're saying, why are you looking up in the sky? Why do you stand there looking? You've got work to do. You've got a job. Do what Jesus has told you. But I'm telling you something. Before we get there, let's identify one of the issues or problems that we may have. You know what? Oftentimes, clouds get in our way, don't they, of seeing Jesus. We believe that he's gone and he's ascended, and somehow in our minds we said, you know what, he's gone away, he's sitting on some throne somewhere, and because I can't see him, I can't touch him, I can't feel him, 
you know what, maybe he's not all that real in my life. I know I'm told what I'm supposed to believe, and, and, and yeah, I, I believe it, but there are things happen when we can't see Jesus because of the clouds. And there might be a lot of clouds that are in your life right now preventing you from seeing Jesus. The only thing is, we've got to tell each other, and we've got to figure out what happens when that takes place. A good, a good example that I have, one of the best ones that I think that I can help you to understand is uh, when we were traveling from either Texas or Oklahoma, we were going through St. Louis, and, and we needed to get to either Chicago or uh, uh, Wisconsin, right, for our final journey. But I remember traveling with my family, and we're driving in a van, and, and a fog bank had come in. And, and drivers add 101, right? Right? you drive through a fog bank with your, your highlights on, right? No. Don't do it. Because the bright lights light up everything and it makes it even more ominous than it is. It makes it more terrifying because now there's a big giant white cloud versus the white stuff that's out there and you're trying to use the low beams to see what's on the, on the ground. So what ends up happening is that you slow down and you end up looking on the side, and there's, there's some stripes that you can see every once in a while, and there's the side road over here so you can stay in your lane. And all the while you're praying, you're just hoping on that other side there's nothing terrible. You hope there's not a 20-car pileup. You hope that the bridge hasn't gone out. You hope that just because you can't see on the other side, you hope nothing terrible has gone wrong or gone on at all. And so that's us, I believe, when we can't see Jesus, when we think that he's not there. Ask yourselves, how does your desire to pray become? How does your desire to reach out when things don't look so great? I know at first, if you're like me, I know at the first, boy, oh, Lord, it's going wrong, it's going terrible. I, I strongly pray right away. And I might do it good for maybe even 24 hours, or maybe two days, or maybe I can even make it a week. But what happens when the Lord doesn't answer? Because I can't see Him, there are clouds that are building up, and it seems like I can't get to Him. Does He really care? And truth be told, yes, He does, for sure. But what happens is our prayer life starts to suffer. We start to think that, oh, there's a barrier, and then therefore I can't even get to him. God's off someplace else. He's helping somewhere else, and I can't get what I need. It seems like he doesn't listen. Or maybe the problems that we face, maybe we think that they're so huge and so insurmountable that we don't know what to do. I've thrown my prayers out there. I've sought after God. I've gone to church. I've, I've quote-unquote done the right things and yet I still have this issue. I still have this major problem. And oftentimes we end up cocooning and turning in and thinking, boy, we're the only ones who have this issue. We can't tell anybody about it. We can't discuss it. We can't have even people pray for us. Why? Because it's all so big. It's so giant that even the Lord can't probably take care of it, especially when there's so many clouds. And we're just gazing up. We don't even know where he is. But the reality is, the reality is instead of doing that, what we should be doing is watching how and when God will work. See, remember, you and I are finite beings. We have a time limit. We put the timer on it. It should be done by this day. It should be done by this hour, by this way, in fact. We even have it planned out for God on how he should take care of our things. But realize this, that Jesus is with us presently as well. In fact, in the three areas he's with us, he's going to be doing things that we can watch what he does. And he's present with us, first of all, in the first step. It's when we come to saving faith in the waters of baptism. When God places his call on our lives and brings us to the kingdom. Remember, this is where it becomes so exciting for us because we don't have to worry whether or not we meant it. The reality is at that time that God placed his hand in that water, whether you were dunked or whether there were some sprinkles placed upon you, is that it's God's work and God's work is good all the time. His promises endure forever. And so he meets us right there. He also meets us in his word as the word is truly 
spoken as it is truly preached in law and gospel. The law is showing us that we cannot keep it. We cannot be perfect. We cannot hold on to what is tight and true. No, instead the law shows us our sin, but the gospel shows us our Savior Jesus. The very one who could complete the law, who could keep it perfect, and now has freed us. Not that, that we go running and doing whatever we want to do, but the fact is when we fail, we have a way to be renewed and to be restored. That's how God wor God's word works. And of course, then the third area, and you know we're going to be able to participate today in it. Not only does he come in the water and the word, he comes in the word, and he also comes in and with and under the bread and wine, truly his body and blood. We truly take in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins because that's what he has said to do. He said, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Why? For the forgiveness of sins until the time when he returns. You know, I've heard in um, seminary somewhere, I know there's a story, there's people that have been actually accused of being cannibalistic as a Christian. And the Christian had answered, yes, we are. Only in the fact that we are truly eating the body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. You see, that's how real it is with real presence. That's why when we come to this altar, when we walk up here and we receive the body and the blood, the bread and wine, all four that are present, we're receiving God's goodness because he is present with us and he loves us. And he doesn't want us to ever forget it. He doesn't want us to ever doubt it for a second that he's not with us. And I so wish I could explain it. I wish I could. But all I have to go on is what Jesus said, and I know his promises are good and true always. Isn't that great? Isn't that incredible that we have the gift of life because of who he is and what he has done? See, in the Acts passage today, we find out that from verses 6 to 8, Jesus is sharing with him, with those disciples, and he says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So you hear what happens, right? Jesus is not only speaking to his disciples then, but he's speaking to us now. We are to be witnesses. Witnesses of God's love, his mercy, and his grace. The very thing that you and I so desperately need is the very thing that the des desperately that the world needs as well. And we are to be witnesses, not only in our own hometowns, in our own homes, in our dwelling places, but in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our states, in our country, around the world. We are to go and do what Jesus has called us to do. We're supposed to love people, and we're supposed to serve the world. I believe I've heard that somewhere before. You and I are to be witnesses of God's love as we have received it fully through his son Jesus. Now, I gotta be honest with you. If, um, if you were here last week, you heard, I think, at least my version of it is, it's, it's an incredible story. It was an incredible story of something that God had allowed me to find to be able to share with you. It was the story of the 70, 71, and 72-year-old people who were forgiving each other. It was an awesome story that God had allowed, and again, I hope it encouraged you. Well, God did it again this week, and I have to wonder sometimes in my own <laughs> little pea brain here, I wonder if I would have taken this new message that I had gotten, and I would have given it to Pastor Jerry if he would have been up here preaching this week. Well, whichever way it is, it's still here for you and for me to be encouraged this day. I happened to receive a text from one of our congregation members. She happens to be a college-age member here. And she takes her faith very seriously. And while I did not get permission from both of them, I only got permission from one. And so because I didn't get permission from that one, um, 
I'm going to just tell you what the text said to me. This is a story of a three-year progression that's been taking place. And she shared this with me as she texted me to let me know what, it, what had gone on. And she says, And so my friend texted me out of the blue, basically saying that she's been struggling, trying to find the meaning of God and life, and if I could help her, teach her more about it. And mind you, that she was interested, but wasn't going to promise that she would convert. You see, she was still struggling. She was still looking up in the world to see what was going on, and, and where could she find answers? And so this is what this friend did. She said that also she could feel God drawing her in recently. And so what I did was I ended up calling her on FaceTime. And I answered her questions, and I shared my faith journey about how real and present God is every day and how he changed me. Friends, I can't make this stuff up. This is the real deal. This is things that are being sent to me so that I can share them with you. God is real and present with us. He's not somewhere far off. He's in our lives. In fact, he's going before us every day. If you remember Greg Finke's book that we went through, in fact, the two books that we went through, God is stepping ahead of us, and he's walking ahead, putting us in the right place at the right time so that his word may be witnessed. It may be shared. It may be given. And so this is what she says, continuing. She said about my faith journey, about how real and present God is every day and how he's changed me. I told her the foundational beliefs about Christianity, and she had started reading the Bible more. And a week later, she texted me saying that she's going to get baptized. You know what? The one thing that had been stopping her, the one thing that had been stopping her is that she had to she thought that she had to forget her Hindu cultural background. Mind you, not the spiritual part of it, but the Hindu cultural background, meaning the way that she dressed and the food that she ate. She thought that being a Christian meant that I had to become somebody else, that I had to look and act a certain way and be just like everybody else. My dear friends, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you are to go and be my witnesses, not only to your hometowns and your cities and your states and everywhere else, but to all the world. Jesus died for every single person that ever lived, that ever will live. And the evidence and the proof is right here. The evidence and the proof is saying that here she believes in Jesus as her Lord and her Savior. She said she could already see how God is at work in her family. Praise be to God. Here, a college-age girl who has taken her faith seriously and who has continued the relationship with the people that are surrounded her. Because if you look at all of her surroundings and her friends, she was the only Christian. Everybody else was another faith or no faith at all. You see, God continues to work he continues to go before us, and He is with us every single day of our lives. We don't have to worry about no matter what clouds show up, no matter what is in our way and in our face. He actually steps through and is with us. And you know, as the old saying goes, whatever goes up must come down. It's very true that Jesus is coming back. The scriptures proclaim it, that it is a promise, it is a truth, it is echoed here in these words again, that Jesus is going to return by the Father's power and by his authority, by his knowledge and him alone. Jesus will physically be sent back on that last day. My dear friends, time is of the evidence. Time is of the essence. It's time for us to go and share the love of Christ as much as and as best that we can. Don't worry about what you will say. Go and continue to share the good news of Jesus because it's a matter of life and death. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.